Coming up on WUFT News First at 5, the car involved in a deadly hit and run has been found. But police say there is no word on the suspect. UF's annual crime and safety report is out. We'll explain what crimes are trending upward. And a local library is back in business. How it can better serve the community now that its doors are back open. First at 5. From the University of Florida's College of Journalism and Communications, you're watching WUFT News. Welcome to WFT News First at 5. I'm Caitlin Schiffer. And I'm Bianca Smith. Thank you for joining us. Once a year, Celebrate Compliance releases its annual security report for the University of Florida campus. In this year's report, there has been trends in multiple increases in crime. WFT's Jamie Goldman is live in the studio. Jamie, you spoke with students who were not aware of the report, but glad to know they are now. It's scary. That's Christine Lacasio's response to the annual security report released by UFPD, which revealed an increase in stalking on campus. Yeah, we want to be transparent with our community um, because we rely on our community to help us keep campus safe. Um, if there are situations involving um, incidents that um, where suspects are still at large, we will rely upon the campus and reach out to our stakeholders within the community to help us apprehend and identify these suspects committing these crimes. So now her plans to get from point A to point B are altered. I would probably make sure to walk in a group and keep make sure my phone's alive and if it's not then definitely make sure I'm walking with someone who has a phone. On campus she generally feels safe and so does Sean Daly. But I do have a lot of female friends and that makes me worry for their sake a lot more than mine. I've personally never felt unsafe on campus but I know people that have especially if they have late night exams or things like that when they're walking back to their dorm or wherever they're living. Um, so that, that makes me worry a lot more for, for them than it does for me personally. UFPD advises students that they can take their safety into their own hands by downloading the Gator Safe app. It has a mobile feature that instantly allows students to call for help. If you want to activate the mobile blue light, you just click this and then you call our dispatch center by pressing this orange bar. Uh, once you call uh, our dispatch center, they'll identify who you are and your location and begin dispatching an officer to the scene to assist you with whatever concern you may have. And when it comes to Christine's safety, she's always ready for a reminder and feels others may need it too. Maybe like having signs of like signs much more up on campus just so students know what they can do when they feel unsafe and what the best course of action would be for them to take. That was Jamie Goldman reporting. UFPD tracks crime in real time on their website using a crime log. To see the log, just go to their website. Gainesville police officers say they found the vehicle involved in a deadly hit and run in Butler Plaza. The car is a light green 2010 Hyundai Sonata with visible damage to the passenger side windshield and hood. Officers say they are still looking for the suspect whose name hasn't been released. A driver hit a pedestrian walking down Clark Butler Boulevard on September 15th. The pedestrian died in the hospital later that day. There's a new sheriff in town for Alachua County residents. Emory Ganey was sworn in as the Alachua County Sheriff on Sunday at Santa Fe's Fine Arts Hall. Governor Ron DeSantis appointed Ganey to replace Clovis Watson after he announced his retirement last month. Ganey previously served as Marion County Sheriff in 2016. And the former Gainesville Police Chief retired this weekend. Chief Tony Jones served the Gainesville community for 48 years, starting as a police officer in 1975. Jones served in many roles, including the Community Relations Coordinator and the Captain of the Neighborhood Service Bureau. He was also the co-founder of the Reichert House Youth Academy, which served at-risk teenagers. A Leon County judge sided with the state in the ongoing GRU lawsuit. Judge Angela Dempsey's ruling upheld laws that remove control of GRU from the city. Dempsey ruled that the lawsuit did not name the correct defendants for the case. The ruling allows a board appointed by Governor Ron DeSantis to manage the utility. The new GRU authority is already setting rates for more than 93,000 customers. You know, Caitlin, it's been feeling cooler lately, but it's not just fall weather yet. I know. I was sweating on my way walk over, walk over to the studio. WFT's Dara Getter joins us now with the weather forecast. Dara, is it going to get cooler anytime soon? Yes, it's still a little bit warm right now, 
but temperatures are in the mid 80s. We are looking at a cool down later tonight. Skies right now looking pretty overcast out there. We had a few sprinkles move through town earlier, but we aren't looking to see any more rain the rest of this evening. We're at 85 in Gainesville, 84 in Ocala, 86 in the villages and 82 over in Palakville. Look at these wind gusts right now. 17 miles per hour in Gainesville with gusts up to 30 miles per hour, 24 miles per hour right now in Jacksonville. So we're looking at on average wind speeds at 20 miles per hour. We are expecting to cool down into the upper 60s tonight. We'll talk about that cool down when I see you in just a couple of minutes. Gainesville Fire Rescue says they are getting help to address what they say is an overdose crisis. WFT's Megan Hartnett is live in the studio and Megan spoke to the fire officials who plan to get the public's input on the issue. That's right, Caitlin. On Saturday, Gainesville Fire Rescue held an event to help create an action plan regarding the increase in overdoses. Here are some photos from the event. GFR has been working on understanding needs in the community to address the increase through a grant awarded last year. The grant was awarded through the University of Baltimore and is part of the Gainesville Overdose Prevention Plan Project. Nationally, overdoses are on the rise. In 2022, Gainesville Fire Rescue did a review of local data and noticed an increase in phone calls regarding overdoses. Gainesville Fire Rescue held three focus groups throughout the summer and used Saturday to figure out what's next. So some of the things that came out of our conversation um, on Saturday were things like increasing um, training and education throughout our community, um, increasing collaborations between different entities that are doing this work. Stone says they are hoping to have a social media campaign about substance use prevention. After this weekend, the next step is a report looking at the past year along with information about community resources. GFR is hoping to use information to help future funding and projects for the Gainesville community as well. Reporting live in the studio, Megan Hartnett, WUFT News. Law enforcement agencies around North Central Florida are sending their condolences to the Lake City Police Department after they lost one of their own this weekend. The department announced the passing of Detective Corporal Tim Parisi. They say he experienced a medical emergency and died while participating in a training conference. His body received a police escort back to Lake City Saturday. Officials say they are preparing to announce funeral arrangements. Corporal Parisi joined the Lake City PD in April of 2020 and was promoted to corporal last year. He leaves behind two children, a six-year-old son and a four-year-old daughter. Contractors are fighting for the job to restore Gainesville's 80-year-old recreation center. Contractors presented their plans for Thelma A. Bolton Center's restoration in a private meeting held at City Hall. The meeting comes as city commissioners decide how to restore the historic landmark. Three contractors around North Central Florida say that they're up for the job. City Commissioner Brian Eastman is committed to preserving the center. We are really moving forward with making sure that as much of that historic structure can be kept, while at the same time making sure that we have cultural events, uh, we can have community events, that it is a more usable space. Talks about the project will resume by November 2nd. When we come back from the break, find out what local building just reopened after renovating. All that and more coming up on WUFT News First at 5. You're watching WUFT TV News. Welcome back. Library books have become much more accessible in Archer. The Alachua County Library's Archer Branch held its grand opening ceremony Saturday. The Archer Branch has been undergoing renovations since February. Improvements include an expansion of 2,800 square feet, multiple new activity rooms, and more than 5,000 new books and other materials. The expansion costs over $1 million. I think this space reflects the new vision of public libraries where a lot of people have this perception that all we do is have books and we have so much more. At the ribbon cutting on Saturday, Archer Mayor Iris Bailey said this project was three years in the making. The Archer Branch Library saw more than 20,000 visits last year. Now it's hoping to double that amount. Big cars, little cars, shiny cars and rusty cars rumbled into Alachua for the DNS car show. More than 60 cars and trucks and motorcycles were on display for admiration and the chance to win a trophy this past Saturday. Exhibitors and spectators voted for their favorites as they swamped memories of cars from their past. 
A downpour sent some scurrying for the cover inside the classic car barn, but a little stormy weather did not dampen the fun. North Central Florida's cars enthusiasts braved the weather to support the fellowship of Christian athletes. FCA Regional Director Noah Wilbanks says that the organization mentors 3,200 local student athletes. Every week in our school system, kids are going, hearing the, hearing the gospel, being discipled. It's ran by students, student leads. We have character coaches, life coaches. There are two DNS classic car shows a year, and the next one will take place in the spring. Here in the swamp, it's homecoming week. That's right, and one of the events of the week is the annual UF homecoming parade. We're going to be broadcasting the parade live on WUFT. Join us this Friday starting at 11.45 a.m. to celebrate the community and see some of your favorite floats. And our very own Dara Getter is going to be forecasting the weather live from the parade. I bet she has been keeping a close eye on this week's weather. Dara, what should we expect to see in the days leading up to the parade? We're looking at cooler temperatures by the end of the week. We'll talk about that big cool down this weekend, a possible hurricane and the tropics and that coastal flooding that we're continuing to monitor in just a couple of minutes. You're watching WUFT TV News. We're looking at some overcast right now. We had a couple of showers move through town earlier, but we're not looking at that rain sticking around any longer. We're seeing some pretty high wind speeds this evening coming out of the northeast, so it's keeping those temperatures not feeling as warm. We have wind speeds up to 22 miles per hour in Gainesville, 24 over in Jacksonville, and 20 miles per hour in Palatka. So we're even seeing gusts close to 30. We're generally looking at those high wind speeds, which is causing some minor flooding concerns along the coast. And then further inland, we're looking at some coastal flood advisories for some moderate flooding, especially in the St. John's River area. This is also causing a high rip current risk, so not the best time to head out to those beaches. Temperatures right now at 84 in Gainesville, 84 in Ocala, and 84 down in the villages. We have this huge swath of dry air just sweeping over the state, which is keeping those rain chances to a minimum. So that huge plume of dry air we had to move in behind the front. We can't roll out a few stray showers along the coast, but overall we're looking at mostly dry and mostly cloudy conditions this evening. Tomorrow and tonight, we're looking at cooler temperatures. Lows tonight in the 60s, even looking at some upper 50s by the end of the week. Tuesday's highs in the mid 80s, 85 in Gainesville, 87 in Bronson and 82 in Jacksonville. Tomorrow, we'll start out with mostly sunny and cool conditions, so you might want to grab a jacket if you're out early at the bus stop. Sunny and comfortable skies for the majority of the day. And then the afternoon is when we're looking at mostly sunny conditions, but we aren't um, tracking a few coastal showers. The highest chance to see the rain will be mainly out to the east, but you can't rule out a stray shower during lunchtime tomorrow. Generally, the southeast is seeing mostly dry conditions. We do have that rain chance each day to see a few coastal showers, but otherwise we're seeing a huge change from what we saw last week. We are tracking Philippe. It is causing some impacts to the Leeward Islands and it'll continue to move north where it is forecast to become a category one hurricane, but we aren't expecting any impacts to the U.S right now but of course we'll keep you updated on that look at these temperatures we're not seeing any rain for two days so we'll be climbing close to the 90s then we'll be dipping into the 80s by the start of next week the gators are under fire after saturday's loss but this week they look to bounce back against vanderbilt stay tuned after the break to hear more in depth about the highlights and the lowlights You're watching WUFT TV News. Welcome to sports. I'm Talia Baya. Over the weekend, the Florida football team traveled to Kentucky, and it wasn't an easy ride. The Wildcats dominated the Gators, securing a solid 33-14 victory. With this win, Kentucky keeps their flawless 5-0 record intact, while Florida drops to 3-2. In terms of statistics, the Wildcats outclassed the Gators, specifically in the rushing game. They gained 223 yards compared to Florida's 46. 
However, quarterback Graham Mertz went 25 for 30 for 244 yards and two touchdowns. Meanwhile, wide receiver Ricky Purcell had three receptions for 62 yards and a touchdown. Here's head coach Billy Napier's thoughts on what went wrong on Saturday. There's no sugarcoating it. Um, we started slow in the game. We took punches. We contributed uh, to the issue by making mistakes. And the next thing you know, we're down three scores. We're on the road in the SEC, and we're in a dogfight. So, um, you know, we, we can coach better. We can play better. Uh, and ultimately, we've turned the page, and that's exactly what we're focused on. Looking ahead, the Gators have a chance to regroup back at home. Their next game is against Vanderbilt, scheduled at 4 p.m. The number four Florida Gators were determined to bounce back after their loss to Texas A&M last week. The team took down the South Carolina Gamecocks 3-1 on the road in Columbia. The Gators came out strong offensively, quickly taking the first two sets. However, they faced a setback in the third set, losing it. But they regrouped and dominated in the fourth set, securing a comfortable lead. You have outside hitter A.C. Fitzpatrick sealed the win with her 13th kill of the game. To no surprise, the offense was led by Fitzpatrick, Kennedy Martin, and Sophia Victoria. Martin posted 15 kills and Victoria put up 13. Anna Dixon played a crucial role with a team-high seven blocks, followed closely by Nadie O'Connor with six blocks. Up next, they will host number 24 Auburn Tigers, 7 p.m. Friday. That's a wrap for sports. Now back to Caitlin. One unlucky Gator has found a new home and a new name. Jolene was taken in by Gatorland, a theme park and wildlife preserve in Orlando. We told you about this little Gator last month when she went viral after she was found wandering in Central Florida with the top of her jaw missing. She has been receiving treatment at the park and gained 1.0 ounces. Park officials say they are holding off any potential prosthetic for her upper jaw until Jolene gains more weight and feels more comfortable in her own environment. I'm telling you right now, I know that Jolene is a big Dolly Parton fan. I'm sure she is. <laughs> well, before we go, one last check on the weather. Dara? Not sure if Darlene, or Jolene is a Dolly Parton fan, but hopefully she enjoys these partly cloudy skies tonight. Cool conditions. We'll be in the 60s, so great night to open up the windows. I do want you to be aware, minor flood, flood, uh, minor fog tomorrow. Nothing severe, nothing that you'll have to turn on the high beams for. Just something to be aware of that might cause a little bit more traffic. No rain for two days, but then we'll be close to the 90s Thursday and Friday. But look at this. We'll have a cold front dipping temperatures into the 80s. Thanks, Sarah. BBC World News is next, and the PBS News Hour is coming up at 7. But your, but your Florida news is always on WF2.org, and have a good night.